Okay, scholars, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, families and household diversity. Uh, as you know, uh, I've mentioned in previous videos that uh, the family is viewed as the cornerstone of society by most uh, uh, sociologists. We all recognize the uh, incredible importance of families. Uh, as I've mentioned in the chapter on socialization, uh, the family is the agent of socialization that gets the children first and has the most significant impact on uh, children as they're growing up and learning right and wrong, learning to form relationships, uh, learning to behave uh, in a way that society deems appropriate and the family deems appropriate. So, of course, family is incredibly important uh, from the perspective of sociologists. Uh, not only do families provide uh, uh, socialization, but they also provide companionship, uh, moral support, uh, emotional support, financial support. Uh, families are changing. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Certainly over the course of my lifetime, family structure has changed fairly significantly. Uh, we can talk about some of the different ways in which families have changed. For example, we know that uh, when we were an agricultural society, that the uh, families tended to be pretty large, you know, uh, uh, nuclear families, uh, mom and dad tended to have uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine children sometimes, uh, sometimes even more, you know. So as an agricultural society, children are a valuable source of labor. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, and, and of course we had high mortality rates for infants and children. So if you had five children, uh, you might be lucky enough to have three or four of them survive to uh, adolescence and then on to uh, adulthood. Disease was, you know, more likely to kill people. Uh, people were more likely to die due to accidents and, uh, you know, hazardous uh, uh, exposure to uh, uh, farm machinery and things of that stuff, that nature, uh, disease. Uh, a lot of the disease issues was related to proper sanitation and proper food uh, storage. And so, uh, you know, people would become ill due to poor uh, nutrition or poorly, uh, poorly kept uh, uh, foodstuffs and things of that nature uh, and our inability to uh, get rid of our human waste in, in an appropriate way led to a large number of infections. Of course, a lot of children died in, in childbirth, um, you know, years ago. So, but as we became uh, an industrial society, the uh, financial aspects of, of childhood changed pretty dramatically. Uh, children were no longer seen as a financial asset, but rather as a financial liability. And so uh, families began to become a little bit smaller. Um, and it, it, you know, it began to cost more to raise children because, uh, you know, not only did it get more expensive to provide clothing for uh, children to go to school uh, and uh, for all the educational uh, needs that they might have, as well as their, uh, you know, their physical needs, uh, that became more expensive. But our expectations of what we should have as children uh, grew more expensive as well. It was no longer acceptable just to wear a pair of Converse uh, tennis shoes to school. Uh, kids wanted to have you know more expensive uh, uh, and maybe designer clothing and things of that nature. And so today the estimate is that uh, you know the average family will spend about two hundred and eighty thousand uh, dollars on each child that they have in order to raise that child to 18 years of age. And that doesn't even include uh, the expense of putting them through college. So uh, families have become much more expensive to have. Um, and so we see that some people are having fewer children. Many, most families are having fewer children today, but also some families are choosing not to have, uh, some couples are choosing not to have children at all. And so remaining childless, uh, even that term childless uh, indicates that a, a couple who doesn't have a child is, is somehow less than couples who, who do produce offspring. So, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, there's still a lot of pressure on couples to have children, uh, but uh, more couples are feeling comfortable resisting that pressure.
Okay, uh, and then of course we'll talk about the sociological perspectives and how they view family. Of course, we know from chapter four that the symbolic interactionist approach is going to really talk about uh, the experiences that ki kids have growing up with their parents and their siblings and with other uh, more extended family members, grandma, you know, grandma and grandpa, and aunts and uncles and cousins and things of that nature, uh, and how those interactions can influence the way the child feels about themselves and uh, their place in the world. Uh, the conflict uh, approach, of, of course, is going to focus on, uh, you know, how the socioeconomic structure of society, uh, the stratification that exists in society, uh, impacts the lives of people and how families often uh, are, you know, that's one of the ways in which, uh, you know, the status quo gets uh, passed from one generation to another. And what we mean by that is that, uh, you know, if you're born into a, a very poor family, uh, in many cases, it's very difficult to climb out of that poverty um, in the child's lifetime. And if the child is a child of color, uh, an African-American child or a Hispanic child, the chances of achieving upward social mobility uh, are even uh, starker. So we need to be aware of that, okay? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how families have changed over uh, the years. We'll also talk about, you know, the different functions that families uh, provide uh, for society. I mentioned socialization and companionship. And so we'll talk about the structural functionalist approach to families and how they view them as being so very important to um, you know, civilization uh, for any society. Uh, like I said, we'll talk about how uh, families have changed. Uh, uh, there are more people who are, uh, you know, having interracial marriages. Uh, we've seen a slight increase uh, as people become uh, less race, racially prejudiced. Um, we see more people willing to uh, cross uh, color barriers and, and racial lines in order to uh, find a prospective uh, partner. Uh, and so that means we have more children who are uh, biracial, biracial or multiracial. Uh, and so, uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, you know, people are uh, choosing to have fewer children or in some cases to not have children at all. Uh, we see that surrogacy and some of the new reproductive technologies have also influenced uh, families. We know that uh, same-sex marriage is now the law of the land. And so uh, gay couples can now get married and in many cases adopt children, although uh, when we when it comes to adoption, we know that uh, gay couples still have a lot of barriers to overcome in order to be able to do that. In some states, uh, they are not allowed to adopt children. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the impact of divorce on uh, kids and, and on society. So, uh, you know, uh, I think in one of our earlier chapters, th there was a discussion about how, um, you know, s divorce impacts the individuals who are involved in the divorce, the children and the couple, uh, but it also impacts society when we have large uh, numbers of people getting divorced, which occurred in the late 1960s when we changed the laws regarding no-fault divorce. And there are some societal factors that have made it a little easier for couples to get divorced. There was a time when uh, unhappy couples would uh, really have very few alternatives in terms of, of uh, you know, divorce. Divorce was very difficult to get, and you could only get it if you could prove that uh, your spouse had abused you, abandoned you, or um, was engaged in a, a, an adulterous affair. Uh, but the uh, increase in laws uh, allowing no-fault divorce, where you didn't have to prove that the other person was a horrible human being. You could just say, we have ir irreconcilable differences. We can't get along with each other anymore. And so divorce became uh, much easier to get. And of course, sociologists were concerned about how uh, these non-intact families would impact the lives of the children and, of course, society at large as a result of that impact. So we'll talk about some of that. Uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, lesbian and gay relationships and how, you know, that's changed a little bit, not only in terms of the laws, but in terms of tolerance and acceptance. Uh, we'll talk about some other lifestyle options that are available out there. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about 
uh, family leave and things of that nature as we go through this chapter. It's a really good chapter, I think. Uh, I know I say that a lot. Um, I really do uh, obviously love sociology and the way that it looks at different uh, issues, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to go through and talk about some really important stuff here. Let's start off with a basic definition of what family is. Our textbook says that family is a set of people who are related by blood, marriage, or some other agreed upon relationship or adoption who share the primary responsibility for, re for reproduction and for caring for members of society. So if someone is, uh, you know, biologically related to you via blood, uh, or if you've, uh, you know, if, uh, through marriage, if you've got a cousin who got married, then that uh, person that married into the family becomes a part of the family, uh, at least in, in our view. Uh, and of course, there is also what we call fictive kin. And these are people that have been a part of your uh, your family structure for a long time, even though they don't fit any of these criteria for the official definition of a family member. It might be the friend that's been involved in your family for so long that you call them aunt. Uh, it might be somebody that's been in your family for so long that you just call them or think of them as your cousin. Uh, and that's what we mean by fictive kin. Uh, they're not factually related to you through the normal, uh, you know, definitions of family, but uh, they are such an important part of your life and your day-to-day uh, -day existence that you see them as a member of the family, okay? Uh, we see that about one-third of the people between the ages of 18 and 34 live with their parents, so that's, that's another thing that we've seen on the increase due to you know, stagnation of wages and, um, you know, inflation in terms of rents and mortgages of homes. Uh, more young people are choosing to live at home with their parents uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, at the same time, as we've talked about before, those uh, parents may now be caring for their own aging uh, parents and so that's what we talked about uh, in regards to the sandwich generation the, the parents are still caring and providing some help for their kids who are still in the household but now they're also helping to take care of grandma and grandpa and that can be a very stressful situation for a couple that's in that sandwich generation okay uh, we see that today more women are stepping into the uh, breadwinners role now when I grew up uh, you know it was a little bit different it was the the 60s and the early 70s um, but I grew up in Sulphur Springs Texas which is a very small town and we're probably about 10 or 15 or 20 years behind uh, most of the rest of the country in, ter in terms of uh, you know, cultural changes and things of that nature. Things don't change real fast in, in small town America. And so my dad was kind of viewed as the breadwinner and that's what we expected from him. And my mom was a stay at home mom. We were actually very fortunate to be able to, uh, to uh, have a situation where mom was able to stay at home with my sister and myself until uh, I think I was in high school and my sister was uh, just entering high school when my mom decided to go back to work. Uh, and so, you know, she didn't work outside the home. That means that uh, she was able to vacuum and clean house on a daily basis and cook meals. And that was kind of her job, you know, or at least that's how she saw it. And that's how much of society saw it in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. Today, uh, we expect uh, many women to go out into the labor force and, and in in fact, in many cases, it's kind of a, a financial necessity that uh, moms, uh, wives go into the labor force and work uh, while still coming home and doing a great deal of the housework as well. What has happened, uh, and it happened in my own family when my mom started working outside the home, she still initially uh, did most of the housework, but there were a lot of things that she would do on an almost uh, daily basis uh, before that now was being done maybe once or twice a week. You know, she might uh, have a laundry day where she would spend all day uh, washing and drying and folding clothes and things of that nature. Uh, Whereas before, you know, she had a lot more time, she could kind of structure things a little differently and work on those things on a daily basis and not let the, the, uh, the 
laundry pile up too much, you know. Uh, and so, and then there were also things that my dad started doing to help out. He would run the vacuum cleaner, you know. My dad, I remember coming home one time and seeing my dad run the vacuum cleaner, and I was kind of shocked uh, because I didn't even know he knew how to put the vacuum cleaner together to uh, to run it. So, uh, and then eventually, he actually uh, started co cooking a lot of meals and became a pretty darn good cook, um, and uh, probably is almost as good as my mom, although there are probably some things he wouldn't try. Uh, to cook because he knows she's uh, significantly better but uh, you know here's my dad who I saw as kind of John Wayne the so strong silent traditional breadwinning male who is now beginning to do more uh, household chores and when my dad retired and my mom continued working uh, he took over a great deal of the household chores uh, so I thought my dad was a real traditional uh, guy but uh, I've found that uh, because he loves my mother and, and loved us children, that he was willing to do pretty much what it took to uh, help the household function more smoothly. So if it involved him running the vacuum cleaner or wash, washing some dishes or uh, browning some hamburger meat so that my mom could come in and finish the meal, uh, he would do all of those things. But uh, gender roles are, are changing, but uh, there's still this tendency to judge men by how much money they can earn, uh, how good they can provide for their family, and to judge women primarily by physical appearance and their abilities as a mother, okay? Uh, but it is changing, clearly. I, you know, I've seen it over the course of my lifetime. Uh, today, we really anticipate that many moms uh, or many wives are going to rely on daycare or babysitters or family members to care for their children and they're going to enter the workforce um, and, and help provide for the family. Okay, uh, Family is really uh, inadequate sometimes to uh, describe some of the arrangements that people have uh, which could include people who are living together without the benefit of marriage or any kind of formally recognized relationship. Uh, we also have same-sex marriages uh, and single parent households and family doesn't really adequately describe all of the variations that we see but uh, you know we do the best we can with what we have uh, there we, we also talk a little bit about uh, how families vary from culture to culture uh, you know we we want to examine not just what family life in the United States looks like but how families differ from one culture to another. Uh, there are some uh, cultures that are much more traditional uh, than the United States. Uh, even to this day, we see that fathers, uh, husbands, males in the family have more power uh, and uh, they may have uh, all of the breadwinning responsibilities of going out and finding a job and providing economically and the mothers may have very little economic or political power. Uh, in some cases, not even being able to vote. Um, and so, um, you know, we can uh, say that families exist in all cultures. You can't uh, think of a culture or a society where uh, family is not important. So family structures are kind of a cultural universal, uh, but they do differ in the way that, uh, that uh, people perform different roles within the family and what the expectations are from one society to another. Okay, uh, there are some general principles uh, that we can talk about in regards to the composition of families, uh, kinship patterns, and authority uh, patterns. Uh, so some of those things are similar to each other from one society to another, but there also uh, there's also some tremendous variations uh, from one culture to another. Well, let's talk about what we mean when we talk about family. There are a couple of different kinds of family that we that sociologists talk about and other social scientists. It's not just sociologists. Uh, you know, we can talk about the nuclear family, for example. And this is a married couple and their children who uh, tend to live together under one roof. And we see that by 2016, only 29% of U.S. family households fit that model of the nuclear family. Uh, the number of single parent households has increased significantly. And today, uh, we can talk about the feminization of poverty, where we have uh, single moms raising their children without, uh, you know, being married to their their the father of the children, and they even though they may be receiving child support and in some cases alimony, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, family female headed households tend to be below the poverty line 
in uh, larger numbers, larger percentages uh, than dual, dual parent families. Okay. Uh, we also talk about what we call the extended family. And I, I kind of disagree with the textbook definition of extended family. Um, the, the, I don't disagree with it on very many things, but this is one thing that I do disagree on. It. They say that a family, uh, an extended family is a family in which relatives live in the same home as parents and their children. And so that sandwich generation that we were talking about certainly would be an example of that. If uh, an elderly aunt has to come and live with uh, a family, that might be another example. But, you know, generally speaking, when we think of the extended family, yes, if they live at the household with you, that's important. But grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and cousins are all pretty important. And I think uh, they should be included in our definition of extended family, even though they don't live in the same household. But uh, for the purposes of the exam, uh, you might want to know that uh, the definition includes people who live in the same household uh, beyond mom and dad and the children. Anybody else in the family that's related, that's living in the household, that would be considered an extended family. But I still believe that, that uh, grandma and grandpa and uh, aunts and uncles and cousins are all uh, incredibly important and we should consider them part of the extended family, even if they don't live in the same house uh, with the nuclear family. Okay. So if you look at figure 12-1, this is living arrangements of adults 18 and older. Uh, and we see that uh, it compares 1967 with 2017. Uh, and we see that uh, back then in, in 1967, about 70% of families were, uh, uh, you know, a husband and wife and uh, their children. Uh, but, uh, you know, and only 30% of uh, families represented some other uh, kind of structure. And by 2017, only a little over half of families, about probably about 52% looking at the chart, uh, are husband and wife and their children. Uh, there's been an increase in the number of people living with an unmarried partner. Uh, there's been an increase in the number of, uh, of people where you just have a, a parent and a child. Uh, there's been an increase in the number of people who are living alone. And then uh, all others that category, you know, that would include roommates and all kinds of other structures, living structures, uh, other than what we kind of think of as the traditional family. So there's been an increase there as well. So um, that makes up about 48 percent of households. Um, so we've seen a pretty, pretty significant shift in uh, household living arrangements uh, in regards to family. OK. Now, um, you know, when we think about uh, marital relations, we can talk about monogamous relationships, and these are relationships where uh, they are uh, basically swearing off of uh, sexual relations with people other than their significant other. Uh, so monogamy describes a form of marriage in which an individual only has one partner. And here in the United States, we tend to pr practice monogamy, but not all societies do. Uh, there are certainly polygamous uh, relationships and marriages uh, around the world. and We'll talk about those a little bit. Here in the United States, we practice something called serial monogamy, which means that we're only married to one person at a time, but we may have multiple partners over the course of our lifetimes due to uh, relationships that, that uh, become, you know, that, that are dissolved and then people form new relationships. And so we might only be married to one person at a time, but we might have several spouses. Uh, for example, I've been married twice. Uh, I'm now divorced, but I've been married two different times to uh, two different women. Um, and so serial monogamy is, is very common in the United States and, and many other Western countries, uh, developed countries. Uh, polygamy is defined as a form of marriage where an individual has more than one spouse, and there are two types of polygamy. Uh, there can be what is called polygyny. Uh, which means having more than one wife at a time. Uh, that's the predominant uh, polygamous relationship where a wealthier man might have uh, three or four or in some cases 20 uh, wives. Um, and then you have uh, polyandry, uh, which means having more than one husband. That's a much less common thing. Uh, and it typically only happens when there's a real shortage uh, of potential marriage uh, partners, uh, male marriage partners. And so uh, you may have, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 
With polyandry, you've got multiple husbands, so you may have a shortage of women who are sharing husbands, okay? Um, and, or husbands who are brothers who are all married to the same woman. Uh, that's very rare. We don't see that a lot, but what we do tend to see more often is polygyny, where a husband will have multiple wives, and, and in many cases, uh, many, many children from all of those wives. Um, poly polygamy has declined in the 20th century, partly because here in the United States, we've made it uh, illegal for people to have more than one spouse at a time. Uh, and the Mormon church, of course, we know that at one time the Mormon church was in favor of polygamous relationships. But uh, at some point, uh, a number of, uh, of uh, years ago, uh, the Mormon church uh, agreed that they would no longer sanction uh, polygamous relationships, polygamous marriages. And so there are still people who are involved in polygamous uh, marriages in the United States, but they are doing that outside the law. If those are legal marriages, many of them are not legal marriages. They may be married to one of their spouses, but the other two or three wives um, are not legal marriages, uh, but they still see themselves as, as husband and wives. Okay. Uh, and so you've probably seen some of the, the programs that focus on the lives of polygamous uh, uh, families. Okay. In at least uh, five African countries, 20% of men still have polygamous marriages. So uh, in Africa, it's still a fairly common uh, uh, occurrence in different countries in Africa. But it is becoming uh, significantly less common. Um, as I said, two types of polygamy, polygyny and uh, polyandry. Uh, polyandry being uh, far less common than polygyny. So let's talk a little bit about kinship, and kinship uh, just refers to being related to other people. Uh, and so if you think about someone who uh, is adopted and finds out that they're adopted and they, they don't feel a connection to their the family that they've grown up in, uh, they may feel somewhat adrift for not knowing who their uh, parents are. And so a lot of people who were adopted want to find their biological parents. I, I went to school with a very good friend for you know, my whole uh, under, uh, elementary school experience and high school experience. And this friend at some point decided that he wanted to find his biological parents. I don't think he was ever able to find his father, but he was able to find his mother. And uh, unfortunately, in his case, um, that meeting was not a, a, a joyous meeting. And uh, I think it has really had a negative impact on him not knowing who his biological parents were for many years, and then even when he met his biological mom, not really having much of a relationship with her. But kinship is kind of culturally defined and culturally learned. We determine who we think our kin are. Uh, in some cultures, our cousins on our mother's side might not be considered to be part of our family, but our cousins on our father's side might be. Now, here in the United States, we practice bilineal descent, which means that our parent, our, both of our parents' uh, relatives are important to the family structure, not just our dads or not just our moms. Uh, both sides of the family are considered to be kin um, and re you know, related to us, and so uh, we practice bilineal descent. Uh, adoption can create a legal kinship tie, but it, uh, it may not satisfy someone who wants to have that connection with their biological uh, family members. Uh, kinship ties typically involve uh, obligations and responsibilities. If uh, your parents uh, need to go to the doctor, then you may feel a responsibility to take off work and school and go and take your, your uh, loved one to the doctor. Uh, and so uh, because our parents raise us and they sacrifice for us and they teach us right and wrong and they invest in our futures by buying computers and, and uh, books and magazines and things like that to intellectually stimulate us, as they get older, then we feel that we have a responsibility to help take care of mom and dad as their uh, health begins to uh, to decline and things of that nature okay so as I said we tend to practice uh, bilateral or bilineal descent in other words the 
the family members on both sides of the family are considered to be important. Uh, but there are some societies that practice patrilineal descent, where you uh, really just trace your heritage through the father's family. Uh, and then there are a few cultures where we practice matrilineal descent, where your heritage is traced through the mother's family rather than the father's family. Those are fairly uncommon, uh, but, but uh, there are a few cultures out there that have practiced matrilineal descent. So when we think about who makes the decisions within a family, of course, here in the United States, uh, we have largely been a patriarchy, meaning that fathers or husbands have the majority of the power. As a matter of fact, early on in our, uh, our growth as a country, uh, the laws really didn't grant women even the right to vote or to hold property and things of that nature. So if a young woman's, uh, you know, if she got married and her father passed away, her inheritance really became part of her husband's property, not her property. It passed through her hands directly to her husband who could sell that property without getting his wife's uh, uh, okay on it, but she could not sell it without getting his okay on it. So, uh, you know, and there was a, there was even uh, legislation laws that allowed men to use physical uh, force to discipline their wives. You may have heard the, of the old cliche, a rule of thumb. Uh, that was the idea that uh, a husband could beat his wife with a stick as long as it was no bigger than his thumb. Uh, now, today, thankfully, uh, we've gotten rid of those uh, antiquated ideas for the most part. There are still some very aggressive males who want to dominate and control their, their spouses, but by and large, the law doesn't, uh, doesn't support that anymore, okay? at least here in the United States. Uh, matriarchal societies are societies in which women have more power, decision-making power and authority than men do. Some Native American tribes were matriarchal. Um, so there, there were some uh, societies that were matri matriarchal. I think that's beginning to, uh, to uh, decline. Uh, and today we have more egalitarian families, and these are families where uh, the male and the female both uh, work together to make decisions and to uh, exert authority. Uh, I think that's, uh, we're seeing an increase in egalitarian families, and I think that's a healthier uh, way for families to operate where, hey, we've got a, a crisis here, a financial crisis. Let's get together. Let's talk about it. Let's uh, look at all of our different uh, uh, options and let's uh, develop a plan to address this going forward that we both can agree on um, rather than, you know, being bulldozed by the other person who has more authority or power. So uh, I do think that uh, the egalitarian uh, form of family is becoming more common, and I think it's a much healthier uh, approach to decision-making and authority within families. So I want to jump uh, ahead and talk a little bit about the, the three sociological perspectives. We can start out by asking the question, well, are families really necessary? And, I, you know, I think about families and I, I try to think of, well, how could we, you know, is there some way we could replace the fam family with something else that would be better for society? And while, you know, we could look at families where there's a lot of uh, substance abuse and physical violence and sexual uh, abuse and things of that nature occurring, we could probably say that, well, you know, kids that have grown up in those kind of environments would be better off if they weren't being raised by their their actual families and they were raised by people who could uh, stimulate them intellectually and try to meet their emotional and uh cognitive and physiological needs. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we can't do that uh, because parents have the right to raise their children unless they show themselves to be unfit parents. Uh, but, you know, it'd be interesting to do an experiment where we took kids and raised them in a, a, a real, um, you know, enriching environment uh, and compare them to kids who are raised by their parents. But there are some real ethical considerations with that, right? Nobody's going to volunteer. Hey, take my kid and raise them and let's see how they turn out. Um, you know, so there's some real serious ethical is issues uh, with those kinds of ideas. Um, and so we can't really do it, but uh, it would be interesting to see if uh, a really good environment, a healthy environment, uh, would allow children to develop better 
uh, relationships with their peers and to grow up feeling better about themselves than children who grow up in some of these really uh, abusive relationships that exist out there, these abusive uh, 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 family structures. Okay, So conflict theorists will argue that families are a way of perpetuating the injustice that exists in society, uh, maintaining the status quo, uh, but uh, I do think that they uh, understand that families can be very important uh, functions. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about all the different functions of the family, and we'll talk about those here momentarily. Uh, and of course, uh, interactionists are going to, as I said earlier, going to focus on the relationships that develop within the family and who's doing what, who's carrying out what roles. Is mom being the breadwinner? Is dad being the breadwinner? Are they sharing those kinds of responsibilities? Um, and how are they um, interacting with the children in the family? And then, of course, the feminists are going to uh, uh, take kind of a conflict approach and they're going to look at the inequality that exists in, in families and they're going to focus on the lives of mothers and, and women, uh, mothers and wives, uh, especially when there's no adult male in the household. Uh, what's happening to those families? They're struggling financially. Um, of course, that's a socio economic status issue, right? Because nobody's really worrying about Angelina Jolie's children in terms of are they going to, you know, are they going to be able to uh, thrive and survive and uh, even though uh, their, their adoptive father and in some cases their biological father, Brad Pitt, is out of the picture, uh, that's a non-intact family, right? But we're not really worried about her children. They're going to have lots of opportunities. They're not going to want for things uh, financially, uh, economically, but, um, you know, there still are some, uh, some components of relationships. It's not just about the money, but certainly money, um, you know, within a family uh, can be a, a very valuable asset. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So according to the functionalist perspective, family serves about half a dozen pretty well-defined uh, uh, functions in society. Uh, reproduction, in other words, uh, having a family structure allows a husband and wife to have sex with each other and produce offspring for the purposes of passing down the family name and, uh, you know, uh, allowing society re to reproduce itself so that uh, we don't just uh, die off. Uh, protection, you know, uh, fathers and mothers can be very protective of their children. They can protect them from harm by childproofing the house, uh, all the way up to going out and you know fighting against the bullies that might be tormenting their child, or or going to school officials and trying to get bullies uh, punished so that they uh, stop their bad behavior. Uh, parents certainly can protect their children. Um, socialization, I've mentioned that, you know, kids grow up learning that moms do this and dads do that and this is right and that's wrong and all those kinds of things. Uh, when they see dad, you know, standing at the uh, uh, football game with his hand over his heart, uh, singing the national anthem, they learn that uh, that's the way you're supposed to behave when you uh, hear the national anthem being played. Um, it regulates sexual behavior. Moms and dads try to protect their daughters and, and sons uh, from predators uh, and from other from peers that might have uh, you know evil intentions. Uh, affection and companionship. Families certainly provide affection and companionship. Uh, I'm uh, not just a grown man, but now a middle-aged man, but uh, I still love my parents dearly and uh, talk to my mom and dad on occasion uh, and visit when I can, when, when there's no uh, coronavirus, right? Uh, my dad's 84, and my, dad's, uh, my mom's 73, so they are uh, aging. Uh, but they're still a big part of my life. And, uh, you know, uh, I've been very, very lucky to have my parents uh, relatively healthy um, for the for the last many years. You know, my dad did have a heart attack at 65, and that's now been nearly uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but he's still in pretty good shape and is able to be fairly active in his life. Um, and so I understand, you know, I, I had to confront the possibility that my dad might die from a heart condition uh, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, and uh, it was a it was a harsh uh, uh, realization that not only was his mortality uh, questionable, but you know when you start to con deal with the the ideas of, of your parents passing away, then you realize that hey, uh, you know uh, our time on this planet's growing shorter as well. So. Uh, 
you know, that companionship and, and that uh, bond and that attachment that you have to your parents uh, and, and other family members, you know, your siblings, aunts and uncles, cousins, uh, those can be very, very important relationships throughout your lifetime. Uh, because they provide affection and companionship. And then uh, we see that families also provide social status. You know, my dad uh, was a plant manager and a lot of people knew him and a lot of people come, came to know me uh, through him. And so, um, you know, my family had a social, certain social standing within the community, not as a community leader, but uh, my dad was somebody who was a, a plant manager and had to deal with a lot of folks and had to fire some folks. And <laughs> sometimes that wasn't always pleasant when I came in contact with people that had had negative experiences with my dad. You know, think about the, the, uh, the children of the wealthiest family in town. Uh, particularly in small towns, they sometimes think they, you know, have a great deal more status. Do you know who my father is, officer? Um, you know, whereas if you're in the lower classes and you say, do you know who my dad is, that may not um, get you any kind of consideration at all. And it really shouldn't give you any consideration if your dad's the mayor or the wealthiest man in town. You shouldn't be treated differently by law enforcement, but we know, unfortunately, that they quite often are. Okay. So the social status that you have is partly related to the family that you came from. Are you one of the Kennedys? Are you one of the Rockefellers? Are you one of the Trumps uh, that has status uh, attached to it? Uh, families have traditionally filled other functions. Uh, we can talk about, you know, the religious training that occurs within a family. We can talk about the education. You know, if you think about uh, hunting and gathering societies, mom and dads uh, within the family or within the family clan group uh, typically provided the majority of the training in what it means to be, you know, uh, a Navajo brave or, uh, a, a, you know, a female in that tribe. Um, and so, uh, and families also served as a recreational outlet. You know, you play games with your family um, and that's, you know, that's all recreational uh, and, and it provides for your health as well, you know, but th those are some other uh, functions that families used to serve much more often, but today we see that a lot of other institutions can take uh, on some of those roles. Okay, so as I said, the conflict perspective, uh, rather than focusing on all the benefits to society that families provide, they're going to focus on the inequality that exists uh, from one family to another and how that is transferred from one generation to the next. So they're going to say, uh, for example, that families have traditionally uh, authorized males to have the majority of power. And so males have kind of dominated families uh, in the past uh, to the point that uh, women and children could even be viewed as property of the husband. OK, uh, the first wave of contemporary feminism that really had its roots in the temperance movement of the late 1800s uh, challenged the notions that that fathers should have uh, that kind of power. Uh, and uh, but, you know, male dominance hasn't disappeared, but I do believe it has lessened fairly significantly. Uh, the numbers of uh, fathers at home with their children as stay at home dads has doubled since 1989. Unfortunately, it's still only about 4%. Uh, it doubled from 2% to 4%. So it is a little bit more common. Uh, I actually had a student uh, probably about three years ago, two or three years ago, who was a stay at home dad, had just come back uh, to school because he had been a stay at home dad. And now his child was old enough that he could start uh, you know, getting out of the household and taking some classes and working towards his degree. And I really was uh, very envious of him. I wish I could have uh, been a stay at home dad with my child. Well, I say that uh, I did stay at home uh, with my child one summer when I wasn't teaching any classes that summer. And uh, by the end of the summer, I was ready to go back to school and teach my classes because my three year old was making me a little crazy. OK, so. Uh, you know, I did feel a little envious about it, but uh, I do think that, uh, you, you know, uh, stay at home parents do need a break every now and then uh, because ch child rearing, if the most intelligent conversation you've had all day was with three year old, that can be a little frustrating. OK, um, so there's still an increase in the number of, uh, of fathers who don't live with the family. And that certainly is a concern because of the economic needs 
uh, in addition to the emotional bonds that, the, that are threatened by non-intact families. Okay. Uh, the family is viewed from the conflict perspective as an economic unit that contributes to the social injustice that exists in society. Family is the basis for transferring uh, wealth and power to subsequent generations, and children tend to inherit the social and economic status of their parents. That doesn't mean that there's not some uh, intergenerational mobility, uh, but, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, for African American and Hispanic families, it can be very difficult. If you're, if you grow up in a poor family and your parents are poor, it's very difficult to achieve upward social mobility uh, into a different social class, okay? Uh, as I said, the interactionist perspective is going to focus on the relationships that occur within the family. Uh, they're going to focus on the bonds and how they're going to ask questions like, well, okay, so when there's not an intact family, when we've got a single parent uh, raising these children, how does that parent deal with all the various roles in terms of being the breadwinner and being the disciplinarian and uh, supervising the children and, uh, you know, keeping an eye on them and making sure that their homework's being turned in on time for school and all of those kinds of things. Uh, they're going to look at those kinds of situations uh, and see how the children Children are impacted by it and a lot of people felt that when the divorce rate started increasing significantly after the, the 1960s there was a concern of all these latchkey kids who were coming home from school at 3 30 4 o'clock in the afternoon and they were having to be by themselves until 5 o'clock or 5 30 or 6 o'clock when mom was able to make it home from work uh, and so there was a lot of concern about these so-called latchkey kids uh, and then there was concern about daycare centers and okay, so if you can send your child to an after school daycare center, uh, is that going to be a positive or a negative uh, effect on the, the children? Uh, when mothers go into the labor force, uh, even if dad's in the home, but dad's working and mom needs to work too to, to help take care of the uh, family financially. Um, What's going to be the impact on the kids? Uh, what's daycare going to do uh, in regards to those kids? And there was a lot of concern about these kids learning things. And, you know, as a parent who had a child in daycare, there's still a concern about those kids. But quality daycare, high quality daycare, uh, the research seems to show that high quality daycare does not seem to uh, bring a whole host of, of uh, negative problems with uh, daycares. Um it really depends on the quality of the daycare. And in fact, there can be some social benefits. Um, now, certainly there may be some, you know, some habits that kids learn, some language that they might learn in daycare that they might not otherwise learn, but they also develop some social skills. So uh, you might argue that it, with high quality, uh, well-constructed daycare centers, um, by well, I, I really should say well-run daycare centers, that actually uh, there can be some benefits there uh, that might outweigh the negatives. Uh, uh, and it doesn't look like the negatives are so awful and evil that we have to be fearful of taking our children to daycare. But that operative uh, term there is high quality daycare. Uh, lower quality daycare, uh, you know, uh, there are some issues there, certainly. And so, you know, high quality daycare can be very expensive. I know, uh, you know, my daughter's now 18 years old, so I have, don't have to worry about it. But I know 18 years ago, uh, if you wanted your child in high quality daycare centers, it was going to cost you over $100 a week. Uh, and I, today, I suspect it is significantly more expensive than that. And if you've got multiple children, there may be some breaks for child two, three, and four, but, uh, you know, they're still, uh, it's very expensive. And so at some point, uh, it almost becomes counterproductive to try to put all your children in daycare and go to work because you're spending all your paycheck paying for childcare. Okay. So in terms of the economics, now I'm not saying that women don't get something out of work uh, besides just the money. Uh, there's the emotional fulfillment, the career aspirations and all of that, and that's valuable as well. But in terms of dollars and cents, they may look at how much they're bringing home after paying for daycare and say, eh, I'm not sure it's worth it. You know, uh, and that part of that is because of the wage gap between men and women in the workforce. Uh, and part of it is that women often are uh, expected to go into career fields that don't pay as well as men and don't have the same opportunities. So, uh, you know, those all those are factors in the job uh, decisions that that women make. Uh, all right.
So if we want to think about uh, families, uh, we want to make some kind of generalization about families, we really need to talk about how uh, there is a growing complexity within family structures, as I've mentioned before, you know, people uh, remaining childless, uh, people having fewer children, uh, people choosing not to get married, people choosing to cohabitate. You know, when I was a kid growing up, if my parents were talking about somebody living together, they would whisper about shacking up and living in sin and things like that. Today, uh, I don't think there's as much stigma associated with living together without the benefit of marriage. Uh, there's still a little bit of a stigma, but it's certainly not as strong as it was when I was a kid. And I think that's healthier, you know, uh, to not have that, that strong stigma associated with it. Uh, from the feminist perspective, they have a strong interest in the family as a social institution. Uh, they want to take a close look at how women's uh, work outside the home has an impact uh, on child care issues and who's doing the housework and those kinds of things. Arlie Hochschild uh, is mentioned in our textbook. She wrote a book called The Second Shift. Uh, and she said that by her research, that uh, women who were working a 40 hour work week and then coming home were having another 21, on average, about 21 hours of work to do, housework to do, while their husbands were doing about 10 hours of housework a week. So, um, and of course, they were working a 40 hour work week as well, but much of the household chores were still being uh, foisted upon the women who were, who were also working a 40 hour work week. Uh, they would urge, feminist uh, uh, scholars would urge social scientists and, and agencies to rethink this idea that any family where there's not a male uh, present is a family at risk. Uh, that's really not true. If the women are able to earn enough money to provide quality daycare and to provide a nutritional diet and uh, decent housing, uh, appropriate housing, then, um, you know, it's not necessarily a situation where, oh my gosh, uh, there's no husband in the household, no father in the household, this family's in crisis. And so um, they would also talk about the resiliency of female headed households and how women find a way. Um, they may have to work two jobs and they may have to get grom grandma to help watch the kids or a sister or, uh, you know, other family member, but man, uh, you know, single parent households, they've overcome great odds in many cases, okay? They would also suggest that we need to study things that really haven't been uh, explored in the past. Uh, things uh, such as how dual income families, uh, where the wife earns more money, how does that uh, affect the dynamics between the, the husband and wife uh, or the partners? Uh, because now, of course, we need to also include same-sex families and, and uh, see them as spouses as well. Uh, but what happens when, you know, the uh, female starts to make more money than the male? Does that create friction between the couple? Does that affect uh, decision making and things? Well, not with my money. Uh, it'd be interesting to see, you know, more research into that. And of course, feminists are advocating for that kind of research. So um, when we think about marriage in the family, even though there's been an increase in the number of people who are choosing not to get married, uh, to remain single or to be in a cohabitating uh, uh, situation. In spite of all that, we see that 95% of Americans are going to get married at least once. Um, so, uh, and there's been actually an uh, indication of a mini boom in marriages uh, lately. As a res Despite these very high divorce rates, people still seem to believe in the institution of marriage. And having been divorced twice, I believe it's a great institution in spite of the fact that uh, I would not uh, uh, say that I'd had great success in my marriages. Uh, I still think as an institution, it's very valuable uh, to society and to the individuals in those marriages. Okay. Uh, social institutions and distinctive cultural norms and values play an important role in romance and mate selection. Uh, just who asks whom out, uh, you know, the roles that the different people in the dating rela relationship play, uh, those are important dynamics that, uh, that are worthy of further research. So when we think about the mate uh, selection process, uh, there's always this question of, well, do opposites attract or is it birds of a feather flock together? And, and in a uh, large degree, I think it's both, okay? We are looking for someone who has some personal traits that complements our own, 
okay so if I'm really good at doing certain tasks I might want a spouse or a partner who's good at doing other tasks so that we can kind of tag team and help each other out uh, but also want someone who uh, has a similar outlook on life to myself I want somebody who uh, is uh, looking for the same kinds of recreational opportunities and uh, viewpoints on child rearing and all these kinds of things so I do believe that if we're looking at certain qualities yes it's okay to look at somebody who may be opposite of us because that tends to balance us out but we do want some things in common as well so that we have some common ground to start from when we start addressing some of these issues about what's appropriate for the husband and the wife to do you know it's not a good idea to marry someone who looks at life radically different from differently from you when we think about things like uh, life aspirations and how you raise children and are you even going to have children and if so how many if you're marrying someone who uh, has fundamentally different views on those topics uh, from your own that can lead to uh, problems later on okay so uh, in the past we know that uh, couples often met uh, each other through family and friends, through workplace environments, uh, through going to college or uh, people that they met in high school. Today, we see that uh, a lot of people are meeting through online dating services. And as a matter of fact, online dating is now the number two way in which people find prospective dating partners, second only to being fixed up by friends. Or family uh, mate selection is taking longer today uh, when I was a, a kid graduating high school it was not uncommon for people to get married uh, pretty quick after graduating from high school and if they were college bound then pretty quick after college uh, but you know the expectation was that you were going to start uh, coupling and forming families uh, by your early to mid 20s anyway uh, today we see that people are uh, delaying that a little bit longer uh, they're no longer getting married in significant numbers straight out of high school, although it does still occur. It's not uh, nearly as prevalent as we saw when I was a kid. Uh, and uh, today, a lot of people are saying, well, I want to get started and established in my career before I start thinking about family. Unfortunately, what happens with uh, some women is that they put things off so long, uh, you know, seeking that that promotion becoming a partner in the in the uh, you know the, the firm before they start thinking about family and by then uh, the the marriage pool has shrunk because a lot of men have gotten married to other women uh, who were more focused on you know uh, starting their family a little earlier and that can uh, that can lead to women being ready to get married but uh, and form a family but not having a, a prospect to do that with okay uh, so some of the fa uh, some of the factors that can delay marriage looking for greater financial security and personal independence uh, you know there was a time when uh, women kind of went from their father's home to their husband's home and they felt like they were kind of taken care of uh, under both circumstances today that's a lot less desirable and a lot less common okay so we can look at the median age at first marriage uh, and compare different countries. And so your text has done that on figure 12-2. We've got courtship and the mate selection, median age at first marriage, and they here just give eight countries. Uh, and we see the, the age for males and females. For women, you see that kind of uh, orange bar that uh, denotes how old the women were. Uh, at first marriage and the men are denoted by the kind of I guess that's kind of a brown bar um, and we see that you know there are two things that kind of jump out at me when I look at this chart and uh, the first one is that in every society the male tends to be a little bit older than the female uh, and we see that um, that's the first thing that jumps out and then the other thing is that uh, there's there's some pretty significant differences if you look at uh, India the very bottom uh, uh, country there we see that uh, 
the median age. That means that 50% are younger and 50% are older. The median age at first marriage for women in India is 17.8 years of age. So 50% of the women in India who get married are younger than 17.8 years of age. That's that's a pretty young, uh, you know, age for marriage uh, in India. And then if we look at the United States, it's 27.4 for women and 29.2 for men. So we're waiting significantly longer. Uh, that probably has to do with um, the fact that we have very high educational expectations and career expectations and not, you know, certainly uh, Indian uh, teenagers and adolescents are looking at uh, lots of education as well. Uh, that's a country that de definitely values education for those who can afford it. Uh, but there's more of a focus on family as a collective unit. Here in the United States, we tend to be a little more individualistic. And so I think we tend to, to delay uh, family a little bit longer than some of these more traditional countries, more developing countries rather than developed countries. Okay. So uh, I'm going to jump forward to different aspects of the mate selection process. And so we see that endogamy is a variable that can be used to explain some things that occur within uh, the mate selection process. Uh, and so endogamy uh, is a term that specifies groups within which the spouse must be found and it prohibits marriage uh, with members of other groups. So in the past, uh, one variable that we saw uh, in relation to endogamy was race. Uh, we even had laws that prohibited marriage uh, outside of our race here in some states in the United States. Uh, the, uh, I think it was Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court case uh, basically said that you cannot prohibit uh, interracial marriages. Uh, but I think that was in about 1967, I think, uh, when that decision came down. So, uh, you know, that's not that far back. I was I was about two years old when that decision uh, came down. So, um, you know, interracial marriages are more common. But at one time, you were really expected to marry within your race, within your religion, uh, within your social class. Uh, and if you were in a very wealthy family, if you wanted to marry someone who was very poor, you would be discouraged by your family and your friends in many cases because he or she is just not one of us. They're not from the right kind of family. Uh, and so there was a lot of prohibition against, uh, you know, marrying someone outside your, your social class. Exogamy, on the other hand, requires that the mate selection has to occur outside of certain groups. Particularly, you know, if we think about the incest taboo, you can't marry a first cousin or you can't marry a second cousin. Uh, that would be an example of exogamy. Um, and I think, you know, we talk about the incest taboo, which says that if someone's biologically related to you, that you should not marry them. And we think that, well, it's because of the birth defects. But I would suggest to you that uh, the incest taboo predates our understanding of genetic abnormalities. And so uh, there was there was this prohibition against marrying someone who is too closely related to you, not simply because of the possibility of birth defects, but because we wanted to we wanted people to form relationships outside the family group uh, to for health reasons, perhaps, but probably more for financial reasons. If I own a large farm and I have a son who wants to get married, and, uh, my neighbor down the road has a large cotton mill uh, and he has a daughter, it might be uh, financially advantageous for me to, you know, create situations where my son could come into uh, proximity with his daughter and do things that were fun and entertaining so that maybe uh, he might fall in love with that young lady and propose to her and they get married. Now I've got a relationship with this cotton mill owner uh, and being a cotton farmer uh, that can benefit me because I might get a better deal on the things that I sell and purchase uh, from that cotton mill. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and then there's the concept of homogamy and this is a conscious or unconscious tendency to select a mate with personal characteristics that are similar to one's own. Uh, while some people follow this, uh, we know that other people follow the opposites attract rule of looking for someone who's kind of different from them, uh, as I was talking about earlier. Okay. Um, now, in terms of 
relationships and the role of romantic love. We know that here in the United States, uh, not only is it okay for you to be in love with the person that you marry, it's kind of expected and even demanded. Oh, do you love him? You know, if somebody tells you that they're getting married and you don't know them super well, you might, you know, you might want to know, well, are they in love with each other? And you might not ask that question because that's probably not a good question to, to ask somebody you don't know well. But if it's a closer friend, but you didn't know that they were dating this person, they say, oh, I'm engaged. Well, do you love him? Does he love you? Those might be questions that you might ask. Uh, and so here in the United States, we do tend to expect that our, our young people are going to have a romantic connection to the person that they get married to. Although uh, in many cultures, that's really not, an, uh, not a prerequisite to getting married. You know, uh, I had a professor who came from India and he came to the United States and he wanted to get married and his parents were willing to arrange a marriage for him. But he said, you know, I have fallen in love with this woman uh, and I want to marry her. And they got married and they came to the U.S. and he was going to school and working on his Ph.D. And uh, lo and behold, they got divorced. And so after a few years, he called his parents and he back in India and he said, OK, uh, I want to get married. And I want you guys to, to arrange a marriage for find a find a bride for me. And so after some months, they called him and they said, son, we've got somebody we want you to meet. Uh, we'd like for you to fly home. So he got on a plane, flew back to India and he met the young woman and apparently he was satisfactory to her and he, uh, she was satisfactory to him and they got married and they now have two adult children, uh, you know, and it's 40, 35 years later. OK, 40 years later. So arranged marriages can certainly be successful and they can last decades and decades and be very uh, fruitful and happy. Um, but, you know, uh, that's not the pattern that we see here in the United States. Uh, as teenagers and young adults, we want to be in control of our own dating life and we don't want mom and dad even making suggestions, much less trying to arrange a spouse for us. Right. Uh, but, you know, uh, there are some real different attitudes from different cultures in Japan. They see romantic love as getting in the way of what they call properly arranged marriages. Here we are going around trying to arrange these marriages and then these kids are getting it in their heads that they can marry who they love. And that's kind of messing everything up. So uh, they had a rather negative view on, uh, you know, getting married to someone that you love rather than someone that your parents pick out for you because they think they'll be a good provider for you or a good spouse for you and it'll help the family to have connections to this other family okay so many cultures give priority to other variables uh, rather than romantic love uh, so there are a lot of variations in family life, and those can be created by the social class that people grow up in, the particular racial or ethnic category they belong to, uh, religious background, depending on how religious people are and how important those religious beliefs are and how important it is that their potential dating partners share those religious beliefs. You know, people who convert uh, in order to marry someone of a different uh, religious background, uh, as an example. Uh, in terms of social class differences, we can see that the, the upper class here in the United States really emphasize the lineage and the maintenance of family position. They're not wanting their daughters and sons to marry someone who is from a lower socioeconomic class because um, they might view that person as a gold digger, as someone who's not worthy of their child and their fortune, uh, inheriting their fortune. Lower class families are uh, more likely to have a parent at home. Uh, and we see that children in lower class families often take on adult responsibilities, whether that uh, involves, uh, you know, providing child care for younger siblings or perhaps even uh, doing housework around the house, cooking meals, or in some cases even working outside the house. OK. Uh, uh, lower class families typically uh, are more concerned about paying bills and the crises that are associated with poverty. Uh, so that can take over their daily activities and their life, their family life, just trying to figure out how to make it through uh, this month uh, till next payday or whatever. OK. Uh, social class differences are becoming somewhat less striking today because uh, because of the widespread availability of mass media and social media. We kind of know what middle class lifestyle is like, even though, um, you know, not all of us are middle class. Uh, if I asked uh, 
uh, if I do a survey of students or, or the general population out there and I ask them how many of them are members of the middle class, what, what social class are they a, a member of, most will say, and by most I mean something like 75 to 80 percent of our society will identify with the middle class, even though you know that's not a possibility there's not 80 percent of our uh, society in the middle class so uh, but most of us do identify with the middle class even if we're not actually a member of it we we, we think we are or we want to be we aspire to be uh, uh, also you know there's another thing going on there nobody wants to say well i'm a member of the upper class because that sounds a little snooty and a lot of people are reluctant to say well i'm a member of the lower class because that sounds like you, you're low class, uh, and that, that carries some really negative connotations, right? We see that among college-educated people, marriage uh, is delayed and divorce rates are relatively low. Um, and but however when we look at the poor we see that women play a significant role in the family's economic support so they're going out and getting work and and contributing a greater percentage to the uh, to the family uh, household income um, there's a disproportionate representation of female-headed households among those below the poverty line particularly uh, you know women with children uh, and we call that the feminization of poverty and we'll, we'll be talking about that more when we get to the chapter on uh, sexism okay and then when we think about racial and ethnic differences in regards to family structures uh, the subordinate status of racial and ethnic minorities in the United States really affects people's lives tremendously uh, in many cases we've passed legislation that uh, says that if a uh, father is present in the home that the family then cannot get uh, government assistance so if the family is struggling economically in many cases it's uh, more more uh, adaptive for the family for the uh, husband to leave or the father to leave the family uh, and live elsewhere and then the family then qualifies for uh, food stamps the snap or tanf uh, temporary assistance for needy families uh, now having said that i do want to point out that uh, there is a misperception about uh, government assistance in this country the idea is that uh, minorities make up the majority of people on welfare and that is just not accurate uh, about 38 uh, or 39 percent of welfare recipients are white uh, and uh, that means that the uh, remaining 60% uh, is split among uh, African American families, Native uh, American families, Hispanic American families, Asian American families, and other groups. So the largest single group is white Americans who, uh, who actually receive government assistance. Um, I think with Native Americans, it's about 25% of those receiving uh, welfare are native or african american and a slightly smaller percentage is uh hispanic americans so uh, when we think about welfare and who's getting government assistance it's not the images that are that we see on the television every night of uh, inner city uh, slums uh, yes those people many of those people may be receiving government assistance but they're far outnumbered um, by people who live in rural areas and people who are lower class whites. So uh, we just need to be aware of that, that uh, the majority of people who are receiving government assistance are not inner city African Americans and Hispanic Americans. It's uh, whites who may live in very poor uh, regions of the country, the Appalachian Mountains, um, you know, very poor whites uh, outnumber. Now, they are, you know, minorities are overrepresented. For example, uh, African Americans make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but they make up about 25% of those receiving welfare. So uh, they're disproportionately likely to be poor, but in terms of sheer numbers, uh, the majority of people who receive welfare ben benefits are uh, people, you know, that live in rural areas who are white, um, and it's not that old stereotype that we have about, uh, you know, wel welfare recipients and, and urban slums okay so i just wanted to make that point very quickly the lower income uh, makes creating and maintaining successful marital unions a lot more difficult uh, what we mean by that is that there used to be an old saying that when poverty comes in the door love goes out the window uh, 
the economic stress that comes from being in the lower classes really wears on people and you may not realize that you're irritable with and, and you're arguing with your spouse it's not because you have a disagreement with your spouse it's it may be because uh, the financial stresses and strains are are wearing on you and it's leading to conflict with people around you so um, you know stress does uh, create problems even if it's not stress related to your partner just economic stress and uh, can can certainly lead to uh, increased friction within the household and of course the immigration policies that we've had has made it difficult um, to uh, relocate intact families from much of Asian and Latin America. So uh, sometimes, you know, we, we split families up in order uh, for them to come here. We, the way that we allow them into the country, even if they already have relatives here, uh, may make it difficult for those family members to reconnect and, and come together as a group. They may have to come individually and that can create some problems. Time apart from each other can certainly make uh, relationships more uh, troublesome. OK, uh, we see that no father is present in a significantly higher proportion of black families than white families. This is a crisis that we noticed back in the 1960s, early 60s, late 50s in regards to African-American families. But today we see that it also is occurring in uh, significantly higher numbers in white families. Uh, but it does still affect black families more than white families. Uh, black single mothers often belong to uh, stable, functioning kin networks. You know, uh, how many times have you heard an athlete talk about the role that his grandmother or his aunt played in his childhood as he was growing up while mom was uh, working, trying to put food on the table for the family? Uh, black family life has a, a deep religious commitment and high achievement aspirations, but uh, that's not consistent with a lot of people's uh, stereotypes of uh, uh, black families. So we need to do more research into these families and, and explore what they're really like so that we can uncover the truth rather than relying on old stereotypes, okay? Uh, and then in terms of racial and ethnic differences in regards to like Native Americans, we see that Native Americans tend to draw on family ties to cushion through hardships and things of that nature. For example, even though uh, Native American parents don't uh, encourage or want their children to get pregnant uh, before getting married, uh, if uh, a young uh, Native American girl gets pregnant, the family tends to rally around her and to support her and to uh, try to uh, help her raise her child and, and provide emotional and financial support uh, as she goes through those kind of difficult uh, experiences. Uh, and oftentimes the couple will live with the wife's family after marriage. They get married, uh, they raise their child with uh, the, the, the mother's parents, okay? Mexican Americans are often described as being more familialistic than many other subcultures and that uh, really that familialism is uh, defined as pride in extended family expressed through the maintenance of close ties and strong obligations to kinfolk. Uh, and so they tend to be more collective uh, oriented and uh, rather than uh, individualistic uh, as much of America is. And then uh, we also see that males, uh, Mexican American males may uh, express uh, components of what we call machismo. This is a sense of virility, personal worth and pride in one's maleness. And so it's, I'm a male, I can do these things. It's okay for me to have affairs, but my partner should not because she's a woman. Uh, that kind of machismo can be, uh, uh, you know, very pronounced in some uh, Hispanic males. Not all, but in some. Okay. Uh, and then figure 12-3, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit and then we'll take a little break and I'll come back uh, and finish up the chapter. Uh, here we see different racial categories and the number of dual parent families and single parent families. And what we see when we look at that is that there's been a significant increase in most categories. Uh, for example, when we look at whites in 1970, 89% of families were dual parent families, and by 2016, that had dropped 10% to 79%. Now, that's still uh, a fairly large percentage is still dual parent, but we have seen a decline of about 10% in those in that in those intervening years. 
for African Americans, it was 68% uh, back in 1970. That's dropped down to 41%. That certainly is a very serious uh, cause for concern uh, in African American families. For Hispanic families, it was 81% uh, in 1970 and 70% 70 in 2016. So we've seen about a, a 10, 11% decrease there in uh, dual parent families over that uh, period. And we don't have data on Asian Americans going quite as far back, but we do have data from 1980. And we saw that 84% uh, of Asian American families were dual parent families back in 1980. That has actually gone up to 90% in 2016. So in regards to Asian American families, they've actually been able to somehow um, increase in uh, dual parent families rather than uh, decrease as, as all the other categories have. So uh, you might think about why those uh, uh, trends seem to be going in that direction, what's happening there, uh, why are Asian Americans able to kind of, uh, you know, uh, swim against the current, I guess, and, and have different, uh, different kinds of outcomes. Uh, so that's probably a good place to uh, knock off, take a little break. Uh, we're about an hour and uh, 19 minutes into the video, so uh, I'll sh I'll sign off for now, and I'll be back shortly to uh, to finish up our discussion on uh, family and household diversity. All right.